Hey guys, hello and welcome to Speedy Medical. In this video, we are going to take on the benign prostatic hyperplasia. So watch till the end and let's make the topic easier. So as the name suggests, benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is a benign condition which affects the prostate gland and in this condition there occurs the hyperplasia of the prostate gland which means that there will occur an increase in the number of cells of various components which are present within the prostate gland. Now as you already know that the prostate gland it consists of two things. One is the glandular element and the other one are the stoma. So in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia, the number of cells of glandular elements will increase and the number of cells of the stoma will also increase. So in this video, firstly we will look at the pathophysiology which is associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia. Then we will look at the clinical features which are associated with this disease. And finally we will take the investigations which have to be ordered and the treatment strategy for the benign prostatic hyperplasia. So let's take on the pathophysiology of the benign prostatic hyperplasia. See guys, the surgeon, they divide the prostate gland into different zones. This part of prostate gland which is present in the periphery is called as peripheral zone or simply PZ. Now this zone which is occupying the center of prostate gland is called as central zone and you can see that this duct is passing through the structure central zone into the urethra. And this duct is called as ejaculatory duct. Now, the urethra is surrounded completely by yet another zone which is called as the transition zone. Now guys, this transition zone is very important for us because the benign prostatic hyperplasia will arise in this transition zone. So, the peripheral zone is spared from benign prostatic hyperplasia. The central zone is also spared from benign prostatic hyperplasia. But the benign prostatic hyperplasia, it arises in the transition zone. So let's take on what will happen when the transition zone will be. So let's take on what will happen when the benign prostatic hyperplasia will arise in the transition zone. So let's suppose that this is urethra and this is the whole prostate gland, the transition zone of the prostate gland, which is surrounding the urethra. Now in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia what will happen over there is that the transition zone will get enlarged because of hyperplasia. So as a result of this it will start obstructing and compressing the urethra from all the sides. So as a result of this the urethra which was patent the lumen of the urethra will decrease in its caliber and it will become something like a slit so this is the whole scenario which is occurring in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. There occurs an enlargement in the transition zone which causes the compression in the lumen of the urethra and the urethral lumen is compromised and therefore it will cause an obstruction to the flow of urine to the urethra. The urine which was freely flowing through the urethra will not be able to flow as freely as it was doing before. So this will lead to urinary retention in the urinary bladder. So this is the whole pathophysiology of the benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now let's look at what are the clinical features which are associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now the clinical features which are associated with this disease they arise mainly because of two conditions or two things. First is that because of the hyperplasia of the prostate gland, there will occur irritation of the bladder. Because the prostate gland is lying in so much, because the prostate gland is lying in the vicinity of the bladder, therefore when the prostate gland enlarges, there occurs an obstruction to the flow of urine through the urethra which causes urinary retention in the urinary bladder and this will lead to irritation of the urinary bladder. Whenever there will occur irritation of the urinary bladder, firstly there would occur increased urinary contraction. There would occur increased contractions within the urinary bladder. This will lead to increased 
frequency of urination. So first symptom or first clinical feature is increased frequency. So guys, the second clinical feature is nocturia. Nocturia is a condition in which there occurs increased urination during the night time. The third clinical feature which is associated with increased irritation of the urinary bladder is incontinence. Incontinence is inability to control the urination. And the last clinical feature which occurs because of irritation is urgency. Urgency is a feeling in which the patient feels to void immediately irrespective of anything. Now, along with irritation, what will the prostate gland do is that it will cause the obstruction of the urinary bladder. Now, as a result of obstruction of the urinary bladder, there will arise obstructive symptoms. Now, let's look at what are the obstructive symptoms that arise in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. The obstructive symptoms are, firstly, there is a thin stream of urine. Now, the urine which was freely flowing is not freely flowing at all. Therefore, the stream of urine will get thin. Second is that there will occur dribbling. You can make out why will there be dribbling. And the third clinical feature is that there will occur urinary retention. Naturally, when something is obstructing the flow of urine, how would the urine pass completely? So there would occur the retention of urine and this can be seen in USC. Guys, these are the clinical features which are associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now let's look at what are the investigations which have to be done in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So whenever the patient reports to you with these clinical features and the patient is male of course and is old age like in his 50s or 60s you might think of benign prostatic hyperplasia so what is the first investigation that you will order for confirming your diagnosis is ultrasonography a simple usg can tell you that this is a case of benign prostatic hyperplasia now what do we see in USG is that the prostate gland will be enlarged and there will be urinary retention in the bladder and these features are all suggestive of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Another thing which can happen in old age patients and that can also make the prostate gland look enlarged is prostate cancer and you will fear that and you might fear that it may be a case of prostatic carcinoma. So you want to exclude the prostatic carcinoma. To exclude the prostatic carcinoma, you just order a thing which is called as prostate specific antigen. And if the prostate specific antigen values are not in that of carcinoma range, you are sure that it is a case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Also, in the clinical examination, you will do a DRE. DRE is a, again a tool which can differentiate between benign prostatic hyperplasia and carcinoma prostate. In case of carcinoma prostate, when we do the DRE, there are increased nodules in the prostate glands, there is an irregularity in the prostate gland and there is also an asymmetrical enlargement of the prostate gland. But in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia, there is diffuse and smooth enlargement of the prostate gland. So via DRE, you can also differentiate whether it is a case of CA prostate or it is simply benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now let's look at what are the management strategies in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. If we talk about the management of benign prostatic hyperplasia, there are two options which are available to us. One is the medical management and the other one is surgical management. Now let's look at what is the medical management and when do we do it. When the patient comes to you for the very first time, all you do is medical management and look whether the patient is responding to it or not. In medical management, we use two classes of drugs. The first class of drugs are the alpha blockers which include prazosin, prazosin and doxazosin. So we have prazosin, prazosin and Doxazosin, these are all the alpha blockers which you have already read in your pharmacology class. Second class of drug which we use is 5 alpha 
reductase inhibitor. See guys, 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme which converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. This you already know. And the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, they include the drugs like finasteride, dudasteride, etc. So I would write finasteride over here. Now, how will the alpha blockers they benefit the patients of benign prostatic hyperplasia? Anybody knows? Yes. Now, the alpha blockers they will inhibit the alpha receptors and alpha receptors are present in the prostate gland, they are present in the urethra and they are present in the urinary bladder. As a result of the blockade of the alpha receptor, there would occur a decreased tone in the urethra. Now, this decreased tone in the urethra will facilitate the excretion of the urine and therefore it will provide a benefit. The 5 alpha reductase inhibitors they will inhibit the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. And when the dihydrotestosterone is not being formed, all the stimulus which was going to the prostate gland to cause its hyperplasia is not there at all. So, as a result of this, the size of the prostate gland it starts to decrease eventually and after at least 6 months the prostate gland size is considerably decreased so that the symptoms are reduced. Now let's suppose you started a patient on medical therapy and the patient is not responding. So whenever the patient is not responding on medical therapy all you have to do is surgical therapy. Now, in surgical therapy, what would we do is that we will remove the prostate gland, a piece of prostate gland actually and it will improve the caliber of the urethra and also improves the drainage of the urine. Now, there are various surgical therapies which are available. The main surgical therapies which are usually done these days are TURP which is also called as TURP. It is, its full form is transurethral resection of the prostate gland and as the name indicates transurethral resection of the prostate. In this surgery, a surgeon would insert a resectoscope into the urethra. Now, there is an instrument which is called as resectoscope, something which is related to resection. Huh? A, resectosc a resectoscope is insert into the urethra and these resectoscope they have a diathermy loop which is mounted on them. Diathermy loop is something which is used for cutting. So this diathermy loop will cut the prostate gland into pieces and will remove it through the urethra. So as a result of this the excess prostate gland which was surrounding the urethra and causing the compression of the urethra is now being removed. So, as a result of this, the diameter of the urethra will increase. This is called as transurethral resection of the prostate gland. There is an another procedure which is called as transurethral incision of the prostate gland. So, in this condition, instead of using a diathermy loop, we use an incision and we incise the prostate within, from within the urethra and remove the prostate gland. So, these are the main surgical approaches which are available for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. I hope you like this video. For more videos like this, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also, if you have watched this video till end, please make sure that you tell your friends also about this channel. As I am in my growing stage, it would be helpful if you tell more and more people about this channel as I am making, making videos on daily basis. So thank you so much.